Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us on this uh, incredible panel of perspectives. I was doing some quick Googling and math in the back row there, and between your, the corporations you've led and the boards you've served on, there, the ability to impact something like half a million employees around the world sits on this stage. So really eager for your perspectives on the question at hand, which is the role of corporations in advancing a humanitarian agenda. David, I want to ask you first about uh, the connection between your philanthropy uh, and your practices at Matrix Capital. We were talking earlier about the role of education in your and your wife's giving, but also how your deep beliefs in preemptive and preventive health care Im impact not only your giving, but your practices with your investors and your employees. So can you start by talking to us about education and how that came to the center of what you've, your philanthropy? Well, absolutely. So first, first and foremost, I, I thank the incredible American people for giving me the opportunity to come here to the United States. I came here, my mom was from the Philippines, my father was from India. We grew up in, in a very small town of 100 people in northern Canada, and when I was uh, just uh, 12 years old, uh, the American academic cohort invited me to come here. So I went to Phillips Exeter Academy, I went to Harvard University, which completely changed my life. I got eight years to work in the dining hall, mm -hmm. and I learned so much about that incredible process. I, I also graduated with hundreds of thousands in debt, but what was incredibly exciting is my thesis advisor in, at Harvard said, Goel, I know you want to be a PhD student, but you're a business person. I said, well, great, I've been, I've been working in the dining hall eight years. He said, well, you can look at a whole bunch of categories. By the way, if you want to go to your PhD program, I better see you uh, sign up for 60 uh, companies. So I went on an incredible journey, uh, 10 years working in New York, and then I started uh, our own co-investment category, driving core innovation in companies like uh, Semiconductor Throughput, driven by, of course, Vincent, and uh, software, AI, life sciences. It's been 25 years now, very, uh, very excited. We started at $6 million, we're now $13.8 billion. So it's been an incredible journey. So what do I do? I do what you did for me. My mom, as I mentioned, from nurse from Philippines, dad, math teacher, when you gave me the opportunity, my wife and I began providing funding. We, provide, we funded first elementary schools, then prep schools and universities. We funded uh, a variety of companies in the Massachusetts area, uh, Meadowbrook, we funded Fessenden, we funded a school all girls uh, for for women in an incredible category. We funded Phillips Exeter Academy, and then we funded a 350,000 50, square foot laboratory, uh, actually for theater at Harvard. It's the Harvard uh, ART, American Repertory Theater, which actually will be finished in two years. We also completed a 93,000 square foot a quantum laboratory, which opens on June 14th. So that was one category, and that, of course, is something that I will continue to my acceleration to the next level. The secondary did, I run a, a fund. We're allocating capital, three ca categories. We do something else. I learned it for four years ago from extraordinary people, like, uh, of course, by, by innovators, who had breakthroughs, and uh, you know, Nubar and some of the other innovators, but particularly Moderna, four years ago, we began providing exome genome sequencing to our employees, to our investors. We began adding uh, MRI. We began adding other categories to keep track of our patient cohort, our investor base, and now I'm trying to spread it out through the country. This is something we should be having done with a degree of frequency. See things early, and then have an opportunity to move quickly. Thank you. Alex, David just spoke about the role of personal experience in driving um, impact and effort outside of the workplace. You, as head of J&J, &J, uh, managed efforts throughout the world. 
Is there an experience you can point to where you felt differently about something J and J ought to be involved in when you ended the day than when you began the day based on an experience you had out in the field? Certainly. Well, first of all, just thank you very much for uh, including me. And I just want to apologize. At first, I'm the only one not properly dressed. I arrived uh, <laughs> beforehand. Uh, I promise at tonight's uh, gala, I'll uh, have a proper tie on. But, um, and also, look, I, I really want to acknowledge and thank Aurora and UCLA, uh, Nubar, you and your team for inviting this kind of conversation. And, and as someone from industry, from business, I think having this kind of dialogue, particularly in today's environment, <coughs> is so important. So thank you. And, and David, like you, I, I think it's always important to put things in context. And um, you know, my grandparents were all immigrants. Came here under very simple um, circumstances, looking for a better life. They could never imagine that one of their grandsons would have had the opportunity and the privilege of running the, one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, and, and, and working uh, to actually do good and do well. Uh, today, uh, certainly part of my knitting, sometimes there's a perception that every CEO has gone to a particular school and grown up in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And my life experience has actually been quite different. Uh, and, and it's certainly been foundational to the way that I, I tried to lead and run our business. And you know what I would say, first of all, at Johnson & Johnson, I was incredibly fortunate to join a company where our founder, um, more than, um, you know, in, in the, since the 1870s, um, developed a, a philosophy that he felt was very important to run the business. And he was an interesting character in that on one hand, he was probably more conservative than Attila the Hun in the way that he could run certain aspects of the business. But on the other, he was incredibly progressive. And so, for example, he was one of the first large company CEOs to make a stand for a minimum wage in the United States because he was quite concerned that following the demilitarization of the economy after World War II, that if we didn't have appropriate wages for the broader part of the population, that it have a devastating impact not only on the economy but society. And so as a result, he, he codified the philosophy of the company about taking care of, first of all, the patients that we serve every day about our employees, making sure that they would receive an appropriate wage, a safe environment, be treated with dignity and respect. And these were words used, you know, today it's almost expected. Uh, it's part of the vernacular. At that time, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then certainly giving back to communities. And last but not least, there was also a commitment to give an appropriate return to the shareholder. And what was important about that, it was considered an and, and document. It wasn't either or. And it was really a guideline that I use every day when, in trying to lead the company. And I, I can remember very clearly early on having the privilege of working with Dr. Paul Stoffels, mm -hmm. who was our head of research and development, and traveling abroad. And while we would spend time on our business presentations, we felt there was a bit of a gap into what we were actually doing to help communities. And that, I can remember the, a trip to Vietnam that really was the catalyst for us to form our public health division, uh, which had been absolutely central and critical to work that we did in everything from HIV to Ebola, eventually in COVID-19 and other areas. Uh, but it brought, to, um, it, it brought to a point in a very real world way mm. that important part of our mission. Vince, I, I have a question I want to ask you about technology, but first I just want to do a fast follow on something Alex just talked about, because it's kind of interesting to think about how in 1950, a CEO weighing in on the importance of a minimum wage is bo was both far less expected um, and far less fraught. Now there is an expectation that CEOs weigh in on social issues that impact their employees and beyond their customers and, and all of us, and also it's a real challenge in this environment. How do you navigate that as a CEO? Yeah, firstly, many, many thanks to this absolutely amazing event here. It's great to be part of it. Um, well, I think first and foremost, we're a knowledge-based enterprise. And um, you know, it's very, very clear to me that uh, we're centered in America, that, that's the root of the company. But um, I think there is a mentality shift fundamentally in the 
the employee base in America, uh, we would not be able to attract in any way uh, the brightest minds in the world to the company to help us propagate um, our plans and our ambitions without having a very well-formed view of human rights mm. uh, and increasingly environment. I mean, I see a tremendous anxiety uh, everywhere in the organization, particularly in the, in the younger category, the under 35s, under 30s. And um, I think... Um, you know, we've struggled, by the way, I think, even at our board level, uh, even grasping that the world is very, very different now. It was a kind of a linear business system uh, that churned out great results through innovation and, uh, you know, growth at all costs was what it was about. And, but increasingly, I've decided, you know, myself and the board and the executive team have decided that what is truly important is Growth is important. It's absolutely central to uh, the vibrancy, the vitality of a corporation. You have to grow, and that requires individual learning, individual risk-taking, uh, and we've got to be able to do that as well at the, at the company level. But, um, you know, we've decided that what is really important is to point the company's treasure trove of technologies at really uh, taking responsibility for building solutions that enable the, uh, the health of humans and welfare of humans, but also the planet. Let, let me pick up on that yeah. because uh, two days ago and two miles from here, Elon Musk took the stage at the Milken Conference and talked about the role of technology in reaching people currently living in subsistence circumstances, people who are intelligent and have ideas but no way to access them or have their ideas reach the world. And he went on to say that he thought Starlink would be the most important company advancing human progress in this era. I won't ask you to comment on that claim. I'll ask you to tell the humanitarians in the room who do not work in technology every day ways that you can imagine technology really making a difference and providing a new tool set that may, that may not be obvious? Yeah, it's a great question. So let me take the, uh, the second part of your question first. So um, I'll pick up on something David said. Uh, the healthcare system today is very much tilted towards sickness management versus, um, I think, prescient wellness management. Uh, so, what have we been doing? We just got FDA approval for a cardiopulmonary device that sits, it's a little device that sits on the human chest, the left chest, left chest cavity, uh, and it's capable of monitoring in real time the, uh, the health of the heart, lungs, and kidneys. Mm. How does it do that? With tremendous innovation in sensing technology, predictive algorithms, um, and we view that as the beginning of changing the way healthcare is provided. Uh, early detection, uh, prediction, and prevention. Um, we're also, by the way, we're beginning to connect um, molecules and data through semiconductors. We make semiconductors. They're, uh, you know, to the general public, they're kind of a weird material but they're in every facet of our lives, every facet of socioeconomic life. And um, we have figured a way to be able to detect uh, bacterial infections. And uh, the key in, in healthcare, of course, is being able to get to insights very, very quickly. And um, our plan is to be able to bring these technologies, I think, by the way, where they'll be accepted um, most early will be in areas that uh, have underdeveloped healthcare systems like Africa, for mm. example. So we have a program in place to uh, be able to bring to um, the CAR and different uh, other countries around Africa. We're in the early stages of putting together a program that will enable us to deploy these technologies to detect critical bacterial diseases very, very early that kill millions of people per year. Uh, and that is how we will, if you like, democratize, I think, the availability of, in the field, point of care, prescient technologies that will reduce human suffering enormously. Nubar, let me pick up on that, because for the last few minutes, 
Vince's description of what is coming to be and how the impacts it will have sounds a bit like sitting around a board table at flagship and the way that you operate with your scientific teams of imagining a future and innovating your way back from there to make it possible and then impactful and valuable. As you think about the, the importance of preemption and prevention and the role of technologies and democratization in particular, Tell us how you think about AI as a empowering factor for democratization of healthcare availability and also cost. So, so look, I think, I think that AI, just to throw that into the discussion because we've gone several hours now, uh, which is unusual of a day without talking about AI, uh, I do think that is going to augment a number of things alongside threatening others. And I think augmenting access to knowledge, access to access and then knowing how to get access to to some of the things that people need either to to receive care or to uh, advance knowledge and science in order to de to develop new solutions all of that is going to be impacted really uh, without bounds uh, everybody is now obsessed around whether AI is going to get things right or wrong I think AI has to get things a little more right than humans which isn't all right all the time anyway and I think we're going to figure that out over time and decide how to set up laws, et cetera. But I, I do think that generally these technologies can advantage where there is larger need than not. You know, a lot of times we talk about, like, well, why do you need AI to do this? Why do you need AI to do that? From a position where we've developed lots of other ways to do things, and so now AI has to come in and do even better. But where there's places where we don't have the ability to do things, I think actually that the adoption, just like cell phones were, where there were no hard, hard, hard line phones, in different parts of the world decades ago, those things are gonna be, are gonna be found. So I, th I think that it's a, uh, it is interesting. Over yeah. I, I just wanna say one thing though, and just to come back to the general theme of corporations, and I think all of, all of us confront this, and I know J&J &J has done a tremendous and exemplary job at this as well. From my point of view, one of the reasons corporations have to care about these things, uh, at least how I've rationalized it, is this, gen is this general notion of a license to operate. You know, corporations are risking other people's capital to develop solutions that are po net positive, not just uh, uh, in, in terms of impact, but also to, to for profits, but they can only do that as long as they maintain a license to operate. That's a vague notion. A law gives you a license to operate, but then your social standing in a community in the world does that, and I think many of the leaders, and it'd be interesting to hear from them, actually invest a lot in that. Sometimes th it's not visible, because we all know that at the end of the day, if we get things wrong, and it's highly visible. And I'll give you one simple example. You know, obviously, I, we went through an intense period during the pandemic, as did other companies, and, and we had a number of deep moral issues to confront. For example, at Moderna, we found ourselves in the middle of 2020, way in advance in our development of the vaccine with no one nearly in sight, this is little known, and we found, we found out that close to the end of our phase three trials, we had basically recruited, like every other clinical trial in, 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 in America is, essentially w white people in a certain age with, n with very little diversity because they were not showing up to these voluntary clinics to be able to receive the vaccine. And we had a choice to make, it was very clear, Either we would slow down our trial to include mandatorily a representative increase in to make it more representative of the U.S. population, particularly uh, pl participants from different regions uh, and of different, different backgrounds, or we would just say, you know what, we're all humans, let's just get it approved as quickly as possible. In our case, we slowed it down, we lost a month, and we brought out a vaccine to the market two weeks after our competitor but we had a representative, diverse population. That's not so that people would recognize it. I'm very happy nobody recognized it. But I would simply say that while we vilify a lot of corporations, in many, many ways, there are things that we all try to do beyond visible foundations, et cetera, to be on the right side of these things. And so I think that, you know, we can talk about vaccine access off, off, uh, maybe afterwards. There were lots of things done as well there. So. I just feel like whether you're a corporate leader or in the, in, in the human rights or NGO sector, you still constantly have to earn your 
ability to operate. And uh, I think if we all think of it that way, it can go a long way. Alex, let me ask you uh, this notion of, of license to operate and the struggles that sometimes exist inside of a company because inevitably there are times that a company is going to make a decision based on a corporate imperatives, shareholder value that a, a panel of humanitarians might urge you not to make. And there are times that you may face pressure from shareholders or others in the community in the spirit of license to operate that will be bad for the bottom line, but nonetheless have to be considered. You know, our last speaker talked about the unsung role of the referee in making the call. How do you, in those instances, when you have those inevitable struggles, how do you make those calls inside of a company? Yeah, um, well look, it, like a lot of things, it's complex. Uh, and it's difficult sometimes, uh, I think as the previous speaker talked about, is to just simply paint with one broad brush. Um, but to you know, pick up on one of the things that Newbar was talking about, um, I had the opportunity about five years ago to work with an organization called the Business Roundtable in the United States, which is a, a committee that pulls together about the top 220 companies in terms of market capitalization. And uh, the majority of them are U.S. companies, but there are many multinationals also that sit on that organization. And we had, in fact, been criticized uh, by several NGOs, and rightfully so, uh, that if you went to our website and said, what's the purpose of a corporation, it was to maximize shareholder value, getting to this point that Newbar was just talking about. And they said, well, all you CEOs go out there and talk about the great things you're doing, but if we go click on your website, this is what it says, what's the real deal? Mm -hmm. And at that time, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of uh, JP Morgan, who was head of the business roundtable, came to me and said, you need to go work on this and figure out what, what should we do. And um, we did a lot of work, asked a lot of stakeholders, uh, not only in business, but from a much broader community, uh, academics and and I must say, I stole shamelessly in many ways from the J&J &J Credo as well. And we basically re-encapsulated the purpose of a corporation in very explicit terms around commitments to customers, commitments to your employees, commitments to communities, and yes, commitments to shareholders. And I remember to this day when it was announced on a Saturday that and I thought I got it right when I was criticized by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and the Financial Times all in the same day. And of course, those on the far right said you sold out. You know, it's all about shareholder value. How could you be compromising? And the left said you haven't gone far enough. Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? Let's see tangible results. And what we felt was very important was for businesses to take such an explicit stand something that had been implicit for a long time. It's not the end of the journey. I think it's the first step. There's a lot more work that needs to be done to actually operationalize and bring that to life. But I can tell you now in the boardrooms that I sit on, the conversations are always ones that involve an end-to-end -end approach. Mm. Uh, because ultimately, those are all stakeholders that we've got to be thinking about. Because if any one of them and look, there may be times when we don't always agree, and that's something that I'd like to talk even about openly here. You know, these relationships can sometimes be like families. We love each other, we can have common goals, but we're gonna disagree. We may not see things, but it doesn't mean we should walk away from the dinner table. Or come back and find a way to work in areas where we have common interests and common pursuits and recognize there may be others because I think for all of this to be sustainable in the long term, we've got to find a way to have business involved with organizations such as this so that the, the, the capital is available, the capabilities are available, and the commitment is there uh, in some way. I'm resisting the urge to pull up another chair for Paul Pullman on this topic since I'm not sure there are many CEOs who have done more to broaden the definition of corporate responsibility and how we think about it globally and our, our importance in thinking about corporate impact on one another and on the planet than you have, Paul, so we're, we're glad that you're here. Vince, uh, Alex just talked about stakeholders, and I want to ask you about one that you made a, a glancing reference to, which is the under 35s. Technology is a very young industry, and it's an industry with 
a cohort of people who have been raised concerned about the planet, much more diverse in their thinking and their embrace of a common humanity, and they have expectations of their employer that are quite different than, for example, the notion of a minimum wage for post-war workers in 1948. How do you navigate that? We've seen walkouts of Google, we've seen other, how do you navigate the advocacy, the admirable advocacy of the young people who inhabit our tech companies? Yeah, I think um, we have a very, very strong ethos in the company that, you know, as I said, we want to do good for humans, do good for the planet. And the planetary piece is becoming obviously more, more strident need, I would say, uh, as time marches on here. Um, but we also put our capital where our commitments are. And um, we are doing, we've actually, in the company, we've built a, a unit of sustainability. And what is it focused on? It's focused on one of the big and most uh, pressing technological needs that's got to be resolved is how do you provide energy, electrical energy, that fuels economic growth, is very, very important to our lives. How do we do that? So we've begun to take very much an ecosystem view of that with many of the big system players. We build enabling technologies to be able to sense how energy is moving, uh, to be able to get it securely to where it needs to get. Um, and um, I would say that that's one part, that's kind of a business input part. Another one is uh, there is a burning desire. I mean, part of the anxiety that exists around uh, planetary health or planetary doom, depending on, on your viewpoint, uh, is to give people permission to go solve the problem. You know, we solve it at a business level in some ways, but giving permission, we have a foundation at the company, uh, and we spend money, we allow our people to decide. We have 11,000 engineers at this company, uh, and we have three or 4,000 of them volunteering uh, their ingenuity, uh, their time, their energy, uh, to solving problems that uh, are way outside the scope of our business. A good example, we employ about 10,000 people in the Philippines. One of the biggest coral reefs on the planet is in the Philippines. And um, our people have taken it upon themselves to work with Woods Hole in, in the Boston area to figure out how to build a sensory network that enables us to understand the plight of the, the coral reefs that once the temperature rises above a certain level, they give out a distress signal. Mm. You can actually chemically uh, intervene to, you know, the, the temperature is what it is, but to actually alter the chemistry and hopefully manage the life of the reef. So there are many, many ways that we as a corporation are using, uh, you know, the call to action that is very, very consistent with the technology base that we have, the, the problems we're trying to solve to grow our business. But the other part is giving people resource and time and support to put their discretionary ingenuity and energy into uh, solving problems from their perspectives. David, I wonder the notion of uh, technology as a, as a means, and engineering as a means to so solution finding has, is evident in the way you work and the, the way you give but also imagination. I think at, ma at many of the schools that you listed, you have dedicated specifically donations that enliven the arts and creativity and imagination. What do you see as the role of imagination alongside engineering and technology in, uh, in, in getting ourselves to a better world and then reverse engineering our way to get there? And Nubar, you often talk about AI as augmented imagination as well as artificial intelligence, so I'll come to you next. David? Well, having started out 33 years ago, I was on my way to the PhD program. I ended up working in tech in the banking world and then venture capital and uh, starting a company. So I saw tech in the early 90s, companies that few of us remember today, like America Online and Cisco and the bygone era. It's very important for me to say this, that in my 33 years of working or 25 years running my fund, it's the innovation of companies uh, like Vincent, uh, companies like Nubar, these, um, uh, and of course also incredible category in, in uh, life sciences 
this is the acceleration in my 33 years working. I'll just give you my personal views. I've been working for 33 years. I've never seen anything like this. This is why we're allocating heavily into all the categories they're involved in. Why is that? Okay, we can talk about how much money you'll make. I, my number one focus is to drive capitalism. That's what I do for America. What I care about is the journey America has given me, an opportunity to be educated, an opportunity to learn the, the capacity to improve the quality of life for the people I love. My, my, my family here, I have relatives in the Philippines and in, in India. I care very deeply about Aurora and the humanitarian initiative and, and to, be, to be part of this incredible cohort that has been so mistreated. This is, this is my journey. Why I mention what I do, it comes down to where the value is being created. Again, my job is to drive returns. How did I go from five or six million to 13.6, 13.8 billion in 25 years? Well, I'll tell you, the majority of that was in the last 15 years. The majority of that was in the last five years. The United States is, I used to think we were decades ahead of the rest of the world. It's starting to feel like we're hundreds and hundreds of years ahead of the rest of the world because the value of the life sciences breakthroughs, my goodness gracious, the breakthroughs that are happening by Nubar and his team, the core chip innovation by Vincent, there isn't a competitor around the world. It's not a company, it's a country. President Xi comes here, right, he listens to seven, eight hours of, you need to buy this, that, this, that, goes on. At the end of that, the president, our president asks him, what did you come here for? You haven't been here in six and a half years. He said, I came here for your chips. I'm gonna use it for AI and life sciences. So with respect to the, the value creation from this extraordinary throughput from this team, then in my heart, what matters to, to my wife and I, we're here for the American people, for our loved ones, the people who changed my life. I'm here for education. I want education to go to our youth to assemble and accelerate their throughput to be competitive because we're now competing against artificial intelligence. It is very, very powerful. And what role do you see the arts and imagination playing in that competitiveness? Isn't it enough that we just drill people on math and they can do better equations or what? Clearly you, you must think otherwise. Yes, I, I am a big believer of, of theater, dance, but it's, it's binded to semiconductor, it's binded to science, it's binded to quantum. So our new theater, uh, which I, I really do all of you, I want all of you to come and see, it'll be finished in two years, been working on it for five. Aurora 2026, mark your calendars. <laughs> and it, it's very big. It's not your typical Broadway play. So it has four theaters in it, the big one will have a category where we can drop the entire floor to be a flat area where we can have core science have discussions about what they're seeing. We can have interaction between regular theater and core breakthroughs in, in various areas. We have political views taking place, right? Instead of people running around, you know, universities with very, very strong views about this or that, let's all get together inside and have open discussion. Nubar, you hosted a dinner with the director, the, the artistic director of the ART a couple of years ago that she brought songwriters, uh, playwrights, choreographers, you brought scientists, chemists, engineers, and the 10 of you talked, the lights went out, uh, but the, we kind of the dinner persisted to talk about what one group had to offer the other. What, what takeaways from that dinner stay with you today? Well, um, I think to this point about imagination, I do think, and, and the, the previous presentation, which was really incredibly impressive, makes the point that we struggle in the present. There's hope that we can figure out how to not struggle in the future. And the only fac mental faculty we have to operate in the future is our imagination. Uh, our reasoning skills bound us to the present. They work really well because they're based on the current knowledge we have. And in the arts, that imagination is, is, is allowed to be, uh, to defy gravity. And the reason we, th th we see things that humans create that are truly remarkable, and we call it beautiful, 
but they're actually also remarkable because we don't quite know how to connect it to what we had ever seen before. Those are the ones that really get our attention. In science, we do the same thing. We can basically make mental leaps and imagine things that are not necessarily the most obvious adjacentness thing, and people consider those breakthroughs. It's an illusion. It's just the ability to actually think beyond your nose. I have a big nose, so I have to think that through, but you want to be able to get way beyond what is obvious. So I think these fields can inform each other, but I do want to bring it back to the, human, the humanitarian aspect of this. I do think that we all have a choice in countries and conflict zones. We can either work in the present with all our disagreements and discontents and, 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 and seek justice and, and, and really get frustrated, or we can also at the same time think about the future that we want to create and work backwards from there. My experience is, having worked a lot, for example, in a country in Armenia, post-Soviet Union, thrown into a very miserable state, and even to this day, as we speak now, mass protests on the streets, uh, they're stuck in the present. I would argue that this ability to actually leap to a future, use our imagination, informed by our reasoning skills, to create, to design the way a playwright, the way an artist comes up with a caricature of something that they're imagining, and, and what right looks like, right? Where tribalism is actually been, it been, been fought by a superior way of thinking about how we should relate, uh, where all this antagonism and xenophobia, you, you know, theaters have, plays and, and books have been written that have used dystopian, utopian stories to actually be able to overcome these kinds of conflicts. But we don't use that a whole lot. You know, politicians basically have to say, immediately relevant things to get immediate votes. You know, people who are thinking about a better state in the future are made fun of. They're viewed as idealists, romantics, uh, you know, kind of dreamers. But I don't know how to solve these problems, especially in these conflict zones, without having that facility. And so I, I do think that we can learn from the arts, we can learn even what we're doing in science, and bring it to bear on these hopeless situations. Because I do believe, and I'll tell you one thing on education, I think that our education systems do not do a good job in encouraging our students to use their imagination, even while they become experts in science and in known subjects, because sometimes that imagination is viewed to be kind of a, a, the weak part of the activity. Let me give you an example. I don't know how many Nobel Prizes have been given in literature for science fiction. Science fiction is viewed to be this unserious part of literature, and yet, much of what's described in science fiction over years upon doing the experiments needed to take the fiction out actually presage science, much of it. So there's an example there to think about. What about political fiction in which then you take the fiction out and you're left with a different order of things? We just need to be able to do this. So I guess my point would be that's why we're drawn to thinking about what can we learn in other fields to try to escape the usual gravity field that we're stuck in about this won't work, people won't agree, people can't see eye to eye, this isn't fixable. It's fixable if we all engage our imaginations more. Let me take you from political fiction to... <laughs> Hooray for imagination. Uh, let me take you from political fiction to political levers, and I'm thinking Vince and, and Alex, th at the discussion, last evening at the launch of today's, uh, this weekend's events, there was a discussion about countries where governments stand in the way of the kind of humanitarian in interventions that need to take place or exacerbate or concretize conditions that, that oppress people. And in many places, corporations have more sway than those in the, the NGO sector or nonprofits who are trying to raise the alarm. How have you seen those corporate levers bring government to a better place, or how would you imagine your way to how they could best be used? Hmm. Vince, you want to start? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, I don't know how qualified I am to answer it, but let me start with uh, the notion that um, the scarcest, I think, problem-solving capability on the planet today is the lack of systems thinking. I mean, everything that uh, we're, we're faced with, uh, particularly in the business world, I mean, the, 
the greatest value is created where you have the greatest mystery that you uncover, and that takes intuition, it takes, it takes imagination, reframing. I think, I mean, I was listening to the earlier presentation today about, uh, you know, human rights across the globe, uh, conflict across the globe. I mean, we're applying very, very simple heuristics to solving very, very complex problems. But I think something that's missing completely uh, in the uh, educational system and certainly the political system is the lack of any understanding of how to understand systems uh, and stop treating every problem as a simple reductive exercise. And, um, you know, I, I think... That's, uh, I think that's at the core of many, many of the issues that we have in business today, that we have in politics today. Uh, and they're all, you know, this, this uh, earlier part of the conversation about the interlocking of arts and science mm. and, and so on and so forth, that's a form of system thinking. And all the breakthroughs tend to happen at the intersections of these different domains. So, but we have to change, I think, as well, the way we think about education. Certainly education in the West is very reductive. They're taught to solve particular problems in a particular way and think about the world in a particular way. But uh, I think we've got to cross the main everywhere, in corporations, uh, in society, in, and the educational system needs a massive overhaul, in my opinion. Thank you. Alex, anything you'd add? Yeah, I, I guess I might come at it from a, a slightly different perspective, and this um, might be controversial. But I also think um, it's important to think of um, what kind of force large companies can bring around the world. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you just go by the popular press, it would have you believe that the, you know, the overwhelming majority of businesses in the United States are small businesses. The mom and pops around every corner are the ones that do all the good in the startups. And, and that politically carries a lot of goodwill can certainly understand. And I would also submit that there have been clear mistakes by large organizations. That being said, if you dig into the numbers a bit more, what you actually find is that the majority of economic activity is fundamentally driven by these larger companies. And why, why is that? Well, it's because many of the smaller companies actually are the supply chain for the larger companies. And so, and what you find is that when larger companies, for example, tend to set standards, if you get to things like benefits, if you like wages, like safety standards, uh, and in many cases, certainly when it comes to policy issues and how you influence things around the world in you know, trying to put what I call more strategic standards in place for many of these issues. So I say that not to try to paint a picture that all big business is great, but as NGOs, as organizations think about how can you really bring about change, what I would submit is think of business, how, how can it be, how can you partner with big business to bring about some of that change that then locally can actually have very significant impact. I want to pick up on your point on partnering for change and connect it to Vincent's point about intersections being where the magic happens, where progress happens. And I want to take you, David, and Newbar to parts of the world where, based on your own ancestry, you've spent time, you've had an opportunity to observe, whether it's, whether it's the Philippines, whether it's India, whether it's Armenia. Where do you see the missing intersections that could make a real unlock for humans in those places? What, do, what intersections aren't happening naturally that could make a difference in economic advancement, in the advancement of human rights, in the advancement of equality, in the advancement of protection of the planet. Do you want to start, Nubar? Boy, these are, these are tricky questions. I'm trying to... Um, I mean, I, 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 I was actually taken by Alex's comment about small companies and, and, and big companies and how much that also applies to small countries and big countries uh, in the sense that I think there's hundreds of small countries and there's a few big countries and, and, and how how the world kind of, what, what responsibilities fall on the, on the big and the small is equally relevant there. So Armenia is a very small country. It, 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 it lacks uh, uh, natural resources except for one form, which is human natural resources. And of course, for that to flourish, you need to have a society that not only has education, but actually has 
a, a way of operating that empowers people. And uh, previously, it's gone through many, many decades of corruption. Now it has a different form of challenge with, with geopolitical and real security, existential threats. So, you know, I, I think that the, the, um, the key of intersection is one way to look at it, but the key opportunity for a country like Armenia, which is couldn't be more different than, for example, India or Philippines in terms of scale, in terms of other challenges, is to find a way to be relevant. I mean, it is easy to be diluted sufficiently not to be detectable as a small country, and, and how to stay relevant and to realize that that relevance is what's going to cause the various larger powers to actually do something about unfair situations that might arise. And we're living at a time that there are some highly visible conflicts in Ukraine, in Israel, Gaza, and what people don't realize, we heard earlier today about the, the DRC, what people don't realize is that this is an opportune time, open season, for despots to do whatever they want to do. They know that it will not get to the front pages. At best, it will get to the sports section of a paper, all these other conflicts, and at worst, in the obituary section. I really mean it. And this is going on with impunity. So I completely I couldn't agree more with Dr. McWege said. In Armenia, in that region, there is absolute ethnic cleansing that's been going on. And when you have 120,000 people displaced from their homeland for thousands of years, and that the world powers say exactly nothing about it, and instead preach calm and long-termism and peace-seeking versus injustice, that's just one example. It affects me because I come from there, but it's happening. One thing I realize is that, the, the, that when you feel alone in your misery, the uncomfortable feeling is that there's so many other people being subjected to similar miseries, which means that we need to kind of speak up and do something about it. So not quite an intersection, but I did also want to just say one other thing. I, you know, I, this previous talk, as I said, impressed me quite a bit. This, the, you know, th there is a tendency in the world, especially driven by media in my view, that is to paint everything on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand. Well, there are two sides to some of these things. There is a there is a morally correct point of view, and then there's a lot of other points of view. And if we give both of them equal time, then you get lost in this. So I'd say there's the two threats I see. You can call them intersections. One is that this kind of you know binaryism. You got to constantly look at, ev and then the second is indifference. And and Elie Wiesel said quite a bit about indifference. The opposite of a lot of a lot of good things in the world isn't the bad thing. It's just flat out indifference. So these are the things that I think we need to keep in mind. And, and, and small countries have to learn from that and try to overcome that. David, you're my last hope on intersections. You're like, I'm like Obi-Wan. <laughs> you're my only hope. That's OK. Uh, when you think about the places that your parents are from, are there missing intersections that you think can create opportunity for advancing society and opportunity? I was, I was very fortunate. My parents never asked me growing up. My mom has passed now. She, she left last year, but my father's still with me. They never asked me, how are your grades, Goel? Are you making money? They always asked me, are you happy? Are you in good spirits? They, they never asked me. Of course, I was busting hard to get great grades and to make as much money as possible. Let me just pick up on that, because when we talk about big versus small, it's very, very important, of course, to actually look at the data set. The, of the top eight companies on planet Earth, seven, seven of them are uniquely American. One, of course, is an oil company in Saudi Arabia. Seven of them are leading technology companies that all became multi-trillion dollar businesses within 55 years, within 18 months as NVIDIA goes from 160 billion to 2.3 trillion in, in 18 months. This, the innovation, I'm, I'm gonna, forgive me for coming back to it. I look at innovation from Nubar, I look at innovation in chips. It's the fastest race I've ever seen. And it's one I'm hearing why am I talking this way? Because, okay, we can go back 50 years, we can go back 75 years, we can go back 100 years, we can go back to 1864 after the Civil War when we had innovators like Rockefeller, we had innovators like Vanderbilt, they were, no, they were nobody. 
they became the biggest companies in the world. Quickly, thank God they gave the money back to America, which is our proper journey. This innovation that is being conducted by the cutting edge innovation, I mean, let, let me just pick on incredible throughput by Newbar and that team. There isn't a, a standard pharmaceutical company that could understand what is being done here. How we got that COVID-19 vaccine in, I wanna say two days, but it's not true, it's 10 minutes. Okay, we look at these chips, this industry went from a thousand companies to a handful of companies they're all being chased after. What can it do? Where can it take us? The one I care about most is quality of life for my loved ones, for my community, for the greatest community of people. I have relatives all over the world. And that's, that's the journey I'm excited to be a part of. Maybe we end on quality of life, because I, I think about Dr. McQuaggie's presentation and the video we saw, and it is easy to imagine how systems thinking that could bring uh, hospital-based care to more people, how policy-based solutions that would create protections that don't now exist could make a difference, but you can't help but hear Dr. McQuaggie and watch that video and think about something that is essentially human that will never be replaced by technology. And so let me just ask, um, Vince, we'll, we'll come this way from you so Newbar has some time to think about his answer. Uh, what, what essential human qualities that advance quality of life do you think technology won't touch? Well, um, well I would have said maybe two years ago imagination was one. I'm mm. not sure anymore yeah. with the onslaught of artificial intelligence. Uh, but I think, um, I mean, technology at its essence is simply a tool. It's a means to an end. Uh, you pick your problems, you apply the, the various tool chains to the problem, whether it's biology, whether it's uh, semiconductors. But I can't imagine that the human quality of wisdom mm. is going to be replaced anytime soon because it's such a, uh, a complex intersection of life experiences, uh, culture, knowledge, and so on and so forth. So for me, I mean, we see it as well. Today, unfortunately, wisdom is in very, very short supply. But Thank you. That, that, to me, is the one place. Thanks very much. Alex? Yeah, um, I'm going to try maybe to combine a little bit of your last few questions uh, with good brevity, and that is that there's two significant issues that I think we need to keep our eye on. Uh, particularly over the next several years that are quite different than I believe the last 10 or 20 years. And that is the cost of capital. And number two, um, a shift away from globalism. Mm -hmm. And in many of the industries, David, that you were mentioning that, and we've participated in have benefited greatly from basically low interest rates as well as global flows, but also global access to capabilities. And I submit that it's likely not going to be the environment that we're in. And I think that can have a pretty significant impact, not only on businesses, but frankly, more broadly on society. And so therefore, we've got to be thinking about how do we make sure the people, the societies, the countries, that those places that are underserved can get access to capital in this kind of environment. How do we use technology in really smart ways to make it more transparent, more visible, so that that can take place. And two, in that kind of an environment where countries and regions, unfortunately, I think will be more compartmentalized, how can businesses, NGOs, and others work to be the glue that helps pull that together? Because unfortunately, I think there will be political forces that drive us away. And the more that we can work together, the more that companies can even have global presence. I think it truly does, uh, because when, in a really simple way, when our employees may hear something on television, this happens so many times in our company, where this was said about China, or this was said about the Ukraine, I would talk to our employees. You know, they were, there was a common humanity mm -hmm. that we shared. And, and last, I, I think about one of the, the things that technology may not solve that we need to keep in mind is compassion. Thank you. David? Well, I think we went through the, the passageway, which is there are many areas of complexity 
thank goodness we're here in the cutting edge throughput of, of core innovation, life sciences, semiconductor throughput AI. What of course is very important to me as my years now have accelerated from when, when I first arrived here in the country when I was 12 on the way to 13, now as I, as I approach 60 years old, one discovers, I'll speak on a personal level, what is this journey about anyway? When I arrived here, I better get those A's. When I worked at Morgan Stanley and Tiger, I better get promoted. They made me a partner. Then I started my own company at five million. Now we're, it, we're you know, billions of throughput. The journey becomes what actually is this purpose? And when you have people you care about, when you're in a community that means so much, you have relationships globally, it really helps you understand what the journey is about. When I think about the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, when I think, of, of course, about Newbar and his family, what is our journey? Our journey is our final message, our final work, our final passage is, did we do the right things to improve the quality of this life? Your wife, your loved ones, your parents, your children, this community. And what I get excited about is notwithstanding the complexities and the very difficult challenges we face with global, with some very, very tough uh, leaders around the world who I firmly disagree with, notwithstanding that, this passage of innovation is the greatest I've seen in my 33 years. It should drive increased gain through put to improve the quality of life. Okay, thank you. And Newbar, bring us home. Yeah. Um, going last is not very good. No, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll Many good answers uh, taken. I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick up uh, on what Alex said about compassion. That's what I was thinking. I think there are uh, kind of a, a set of things that drive human behavior um, that seem nebulous to us. And the question will be, I don't know if technology will ever be able to figure it out, AI, is whether that can be uh, disaggregated and recomposed in such a way that it could fool us. But so, for example, when humans say, I feel sorry, I feel your pain, well, the question is, what would the replica of that be in, a, in an LLM, in a large language model? What does feeling sorry mean? Empathy, part of compassion. What does feeling grateful mean? Right? Are we going to have programs that are going to feel grateful that we use them or that grateful that they helped us do it? So these feelings so, so profoundly impact human behavior that it would, be, it would be interesting if, in fact, technology could emulate that. And, and one of my colleagues, Armin McGurchan, who's in this room, is working on things like this anyway, these agent-based models. Because if we could do that, we might actually learn more about what it is to be human by seeing a, a struggling machine try to figure out how to act like a human and actually realizing where some of the things are going wrong in the way humans interact and we behave. But I think that's where it's going to be at least difficult, this kind of systems level to, to what Vince said, complex interacting set of things which make human, humans feel pain, right? I mean, so we have sophisticated mechanism to be driven by fear, to be driven by pain, and, and, and systems that can actually begin to, to capture that if they came to be, I think might be worrisome, but they may also be helpful in learning more about ourselves, because uh, we clearly haven't figured out how to how to make room for each other's pain, how to make room for each other's sensations, and rather are, as was mentioned in the previous talk, highly focused on ourselves and people in the little group that we allow ourselves in the tribe that we allow ourselves to be. So I can't say it will never happen, but that's an area where I think uh, some good can come out of technology could figure that out. Thank you. I, I will add my own, which is the alchemy of live human conversation that is unscripted and unplanned and uh, brings forth things that we didn't know and didn't expect. So uh, please join me in thanking this panel well for their wisdom, their compassion.